Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all hear me? Is that through? Yeah, yeah. All right, come on. Rally Conference, how are we feeling today? Yeah. Y'all ready to roll? All right, I'm so stoked uh, to be with you guys. Um, if I have not met you yet, uh, my name is John O'Gates, and I have the opportunity to travel the country as an evangelist. And that's just a fancy word. I was talking the other day to this guy at the gym, and he's like, man, what do you do for work? I said, dude, I'm an evangelist. He's like, oh, so you're an atheist. I was like, no, like the total opposite of that, actually. Uh, but that's just a fancy term for I get to travel the country and preach God's word. And it has been the highest privilege of my life. And one of the greatest gifts in my life is my wife, Kylie. She was here with me last time I was here with you guys. I believe it was in January. And we're excited to be back with you guys. I'm going to preach a message that I hope will stir up your faith. Uh, I want to let some students know in the room tonight, or today, I guess it's the afternoon, that God has a purpose for you. Do you believe that? That God actually created you on purpose for a purpose. And I see so many believers that don't operate in the purpose that God has for them because they don't believe that they have any significance about them. And I want to preach a message. We're going to look at the story of an individual. Uh, his name's Joseph. How many of y'all have ever heard of the story Joseph before? Joseph is an incredible character. We're going to dig into him, but uh, I'm going to preach a message that if you're taking notes, I entitled this message, The Paradox of Purpose. The Paradox of Purpose. And my hope is to just breathe some faith into your journey and your walk with Jesus. Amen? Come on. How many of you guys know life is already hard? <laughs> life is already complicated. We're already beat up the moment that we go out of these four walls, and we just need uh, an injection of joy and an adrenaline kick in our faith journey. And so my hope is to do that for you today. We're going to be uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 39 to look at the story of Joseph. I'm not going to read the text quite yet, but I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into things. Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you for Rally Conference 2024. God, I pray for the student that walked in here tonight. I pray that you would fill them with hope. I pray that they would leave encouraged. I pray for a divine perspective shift. God, I pray for the mindsets that have been limiting and are full of lack. God, that you would fill them with more. You would increase them to step into the purpose and the calling that you have for them today. God, I pray today would just be a moment that we see a move of God take place, that this would be a catalyst, an anchor point for our journey of following you. God, we love you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Have, have any of you guys ever had a crazy moment in your life that you wish you could go back and have a redo? Like you really wish things could have gone a little different. I remember there was a time when I was a, a graduate of college. I just accepted a youth pastor role in Rochester, Minnesota, and I was about to leave all of my friends, and my buddy Tyler, he calls me, says, hey man, before you leave in a couple weeks, we need to have one big gathering with myself, with you, and our buddy Micah. And he's like, I have an idea. This will be a great guy's time. This will be a bonding experience. He says, I want to take us mountain bike, mountain biking, and I'm like, I've never really done mountain bike before. I've always like, you know, had a pedal bike. He goes, but dude, we're going to go through some crazy trails. It's going to be a good time. And now like, I'm kind of the guy that's like, that sounds great, but safety first. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's get the helmets. Let's make sure we got the knee pads, the elbow pads, everything ready to roll. He goes, dude, I'll have a helmet for you. No problem. So I roll up to his house. He's got three mountain bikes, one for me, one for Mike, and one for himself, but I see no helmets. I look at him, I said, bro, I ain't getting on this helmet. My mama raised me to always wear a helmet. You know what I'm saying? And y'all are like, helmet people? Nobody. Wow. I guess that's so out of style nowadays. Okay. Sounds good. Growing up, uh, my mom was like, you are not getting on that bicycle unless you have a helmet. I was like, okay, sounds good. So I just had that ingrained in me. So we roll up I'm a little apprehensive because I'm like, I don't want to die. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to break a bone. Like this is just going to go poor. We're going through all these trails, and about midway through our mountain bike experience, my buddy Tyler gets this bright idea. Any of you guys got those friends that just come up with the dumbest ideas? If you don't, you're the friend, okay? 
My buddy Tyler, he goes, hey guys, I have a great idea. This will spice up our bonding experience. He looks up to the left and there is this massive, I'm gonna say mountain. And he goes, let's go up to the top of that hill and hang out. I was like, okay, sounds good. So we're just kind of taking a little intermission from our biking experience. And we're up there for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And Tyler then gets another bright idea. He goes, boys, it's time we spice up our life a little bit. I was like, how so? He's like, let's ride our bikes down the hill. Now, I just want to set the stage for you guys. So this hill was literally... Um, this steep, okay? Like, this, like, it was almost a dead drop down. So I'm like, Tyler, that is the dumbest idea you've ever had in your life. I want to marry someday. I want to raise kids someday. Like, I, I want to experience life someday. And he goes, no, no, come on. Are you a little sissy? And I'm like, oh, heck no. Like, you know the friends that just chirp at you when you ain't, like, ready to do what they want you to do? So he starts chirping, and then Micah starts chirping. I said, okay, Tyler, if you're so brave, why don't you go first? He's like, fine, I will go first. So here Tyler rolls up. He gets on his bike. He's kind of like wading over the edge of this mountain. I'm just going to keep calling it a mountain. And he starts rolling down the mountain, and by the grace of God, he makes it all the way down. This dude was shaking and bumping and all over the, but he made it down. So now he's full of adrenaline and he's all hyped up thinking that he's the man. And he's like, come on, Jono, let's see what you got. And I'm like, okay, God, it's been good. I've, uh, you know, 22 years old, had a good full life. Like this is the time that I now die. And so I roll up to the edge of this mountain and I'm like, you know what? I never thought my life would end this way. <laughs> like I just imagined that I would be having a family and meeting my wife someday and all these things. And kind of reflective and contemplative, and I, I roll up to the edge, and the next thing I know, I slowly start going. Y'all, I don't even remember what happened. I like blacked out, but by the grace of God, I made it down the hill. Can we just take a praise break and thank God for that? Now, here I, I'm so excited. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm the man. Like, I'm hyped. So I look back up at my buddy Micah and I start chirping him because I'm like, come on, man, you talking so loud. Let's see what you got. This dude rolls up to the edge of this mountain, leans forward. He starts aggressively pedaling. Okay. So me and Tyler are witnessing one of our best friends, Micah, fly down this cliff, <laughs> bumping Shaken, the next thing we see, he catches air because he hits a rock. The front wheel flies over top. He literally probably flew, no lot, no exaggeration, maybe 10 to 15 feet. Hits the ground, boom, it's just silent. So me and Tyler are like, Oh my gosh, that was crazy. Wow, like that was radical. Silence. And I'm kind of like, okay, Micah, you good? Nothing. I'm like, Micah, and I was like, I think we need to go check. And Tyler's like, oh, he's fine. I'm like, I don't, I think he's dead. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that's like a fine thing. So I run up to him and I'm like, Micah, are you okay? And he's sitting there, literally on the ground. And he kind of gets up, he goes, oh, and I'm like, praise God, like you're alive. Looks at me, kind of like dazed and shaking back and forth a little bit. And I said, are you okay, are you okay? And he goes, man, what happened? I was like, bro, like, you just took the most gnarly spill I've ever seen in my life. He goes, wow. And then as they looked at me, he goes, what happened? And I'm like, dude, you just took one of the most aggressive spills I've ever seen. He goes, oh, what happened? And I'm like, Tyler, <laughs> our friend has lost his mind. Like, 
what do we do? And Tyler runs over. You know that like friend that tries to be like all adultish and logical, but he really has no control over the situation. He's like, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. I'm like, he's not fine. Like, stop saying that. What I'm seeing right now is not at all living up to what you're saying. And I'm like, bro, he's gonna like, literally it's peel over and have a brain hemorrhage and like we're responsible. So we need to take him to the hospital. So I was like, Tyler, you call his fiance. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I don't want to suffer the wrath of Katie. And so I had this eerie feeling. I was like, what if she doesn't? What if he doesn't remember Katie? Like, I will kill myself. Like, just light myself on fire and just like pass away because I'm going to feel terrible. That was very dark. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said that. Sorry, I didn't mean to be insensitive. But I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm hearing what you're saying, Tyler, but what I'm, what I'm seeing is, is not really happening. So we roll up to the hospital. He gets some scans done, and Tyler steps out to uh, talk to the doctors as they're kind of telling him about the situation, what's going on. Turns out he had a massive, massive concussion. Anyone ever had a massive concussion before? We've got some athletes. So I'm sitting in the room and like, when I'm in a pressure situation, I just say stupid stuff, right? Like you just, anyone have that friend that you're like, you just don't really know what to say, so you just kind of start talking. So I'm like trying to think of things to talk about to keep him distracted. And I'm like, man, Micah, when I move to Rochester, I'm really gonna miss you. And all of a sudden, and he was one of the first people I told that I would be leaving the cities to go to Rochester to take over this position. And obviously with his memory relapse, he forgot. So tears start to fill his eyes. And he goes, you're leaving? And I was like, yeah, I am. (laughs) No joke, it was like his eyes just like reset and his brain just went back to a relapse. And I was like, Micah, I'm really gonna miss you when when I go to Rochester. And all of a sudden he goes, you're leaving? And I'm like, yeah. It's like, I was feeling really good about it. So Tyler comes in. He goes, you know what? You know what? Like, that was a bad situation. I was like, Tyler, you kept telling me he's fine, but clearly he's not fine. He doesn't even remember that I'm moving to Rochester. Have you guys ever had a moment in your life or a moment in the journey of following Jesus where what was said doesn't line up with what you currently see? You guys ever had a moment in your life where what you expected to happen, where what you were told would happen is not the current reality of what is happening? Now, the truth is many of us today have come into Rally Conference 2024, and many of you guys have experienced a word from God spoken over your life for the very first time. Many of you guys maybe experienced healing by the hand of God for the very first time in your life. Maybe some of you guys got a vision from God about your future, and you're leaving conference today very excited about the plans and the purpose that God God has for your life, and you're very eager to see how God unfolds this journey that he has now revealed a glimpse to you of. But today, as we are in session two of Rally Conference, I don't want to talk to you currently in the room. I want to talk to the future you. I don't want to talk to the current you that's sitting in this room right now, sitting to next to maybe one of your best friends. I want to talk to the future you four weeks from now that's still waiting on the word from God that God spoke over your life. I want to talk to the future you four months from now that's still holding on to hope, that's still waiting for God to show up, that's still asking the same questions, God, was that even real? God, did you even say anything? I wanna talk to the person four years from now that you're no longer at Rally Conference 2024, but you've gone home back into the same old environment the same old space, the same old routine, and you still haven't seen what God has said. I want to talk to that you 
the future you, the you that the expectation of what you thought would happen after conference isn't the reality of what did happen after conference. I want to talk to the you that's still holding on to hope, wondering if God even said it, wondering if God even meant it, wondering if God even cares. That's the you and you feel like your faith in this moment and your future is fractured, and you feel like your feelings are just floundering, wondering, was any of this stuff real? Was this just some emotionalistic high? Does God even care? Was this all just a waste? I want to speak to that you. Because, like, what happens... When, when we leave a conference much like today, full of faith on a, on a high note spiritually about what God has spoken over your life, but four years from now, you still don't see the fruit of that in your life. What happens when what God says about you, you don't see within you? Because here's where I feel it. I was just talking to my wife about this today. It's like, the Bible says that I have authority, but I still feel my insecurity. The Bible says I'm saved and set free, but there's moments in my life I still feel stuck. Now, don't get me wrong. These things sound good. They sound great, but they're a whole lot easier to say than they are to see. See, I don't see what God sees. I don't see the point. I don't see the purpose. I don't see how I can become the very person that he has called me to become. I don't see how I can do the very thing that God has called me to do when what I see doesn't line what up, doesn't line up with what God has said. That is what we call the paradox of our purpose. And at one point or another in our journey of following Jesus, we will have to bridge this tension if you and I are ever going to step into what God has called us to do and fulfill the purpose that God has for our life. But I need us to understand something, that every single one of us in this room are in the process, turn to the person next to you and say process, of walking out your purpose. Every single one of us in this room are in the process, the journey of walking out the purpose that God has placed over your life. And whether you've been following Jesus for five minutes or you've been following Jesus for 50 years, we are all in the process of walking through what God has called you to. Because we all have a purpose. You were created on purpose, for purpose, and by a purpose. And how do you and I go from where we are today to where God has called us to be tomorrow? How do we go from who I am in my own dysfunction, in my own immaturities, in my own insecurities, into the man and the woman of God that is full of authority, that's full of faith, that's full of confidence? I want us to look at the life of Joseph. Joseph is such an interesting character because here is a guy who gets a dream, a promise, a purpose per se from God about his life. And in this moment, Joseph maybe immaturely expresses and shares this dream with his brothers. Now, his brothers naturally, when you share a dream about how everyone's going to bow down and worship you, it naturally doesn't go over very well. And the Bible says that his brothers conspired against him and they actually were so frustrated with him that they wanted to kill him. One of them gets wise. He says, hey, let's actually not kill him. Let's spare him by throwing him in a pit. How generous is that? Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, when your family decides to conspire against you and attempts to potentially kill you and they throw you in a pit and leave you for dead, that's not going to feel very good. So here is Joseph. He's in the pit and they decide, you know what? Instead, we're actually going to sell him to the Ishmaelites. And Joseph finds himself on this journey of being in Egypt. He then gets bought by this man named Potiphar. Now, Joseph had so much favor with God that Potiphar found favor with him, and he placed Joseph over his entire household. So here we are in the story of Joseph, and I wonder if I'm Joseph, I think it would be so easy to look at God and be like, bro, what's the deal? 
You just gave me this word. You just gave me this purpose. You just gave me this promise for my life. And now I'm finding myself in a situation, in a space, and in a season of my life that is total contrary to this. Like, this isn't supposed to be where I am. This isn't supposed to be how it goes. It wasn't supposed to go the way this went. And see, students, if you're taking notes, my first point today is simply this. When God gives a promise, he leads you through a process. He leads you through a process. Now, I don't know about you guys, but we often have a picture of what the promise and the purpose of God for our life looks like. Now, I brought an illustration because I wanted to kind of paint this very clearly. How many of you guys like Legos? What God often does is when God gives you a purpose, when God gives you a promise, when God gives you a vision for your life, he will often show you a glimpse. So this Lego kit looks legit, okay? Anyone love Star-Lord? Dude, Marvel all the way. And I think so many of us, we get infatuated with the picture of the promise that God has for our life. But here's the thing I need you to understand, that every single time that God gives a promise or gives you a glimpse into your purpose, it always comes in the form of pieces. And I think there's moments where we can look at this, and then we look back at this, and we're frustrated. But hear me, students. You may get the image, but don't forget there's still the instructions. There's still a process of producing the purpose that God is wanting to fulfill in your life. Every purpose that God gives you comes in pieces. It comes in seeds. And it's our job to be faithful with the pieces that God provides so we can produce the promise that he's leading us towards. But the issue is we want to literally see this thing right out of the gate. And I don't know about you guys, but I truly believe that Joseph didn't just arrive at his promise. How many of you know he had to walk to his promise in the form of what we know it to be, the process? The process, students, is the tool that God uses to bring about his purpose in your life. The process is the time, it's the space, it's the gap between what God has spoken and the fulfillment of what you see. The process is when God is developing in you the things that are necessary to sustain the promise that's ahead of you. It's when God is pulling out of your life the things he did not put in your life. It's when he cultivates your character. It's when he builds up the integrity in your spirit. It's when he takes his time to create things in your life. See, we have such an emphasis on the platform but we don't have an emphasis on developing people of character. We have such a lack of integrity and consistency and accountability in our life and around our world. And I believe that God is looking to develop people's character and see God cares about who you are on the inside. And Joseph had this dream, he had this promise from God that God had given him. It was great, it was sweet. It looked awesome, but he now finds himself in a place that doesn't look at all like his promise. Like, I'm sorry, like, this is nothing like that. 
And I think so many of us are frustrated with God because God spoke something over our life and we were expecting to immediately produce the image on the box. But he's saying, no, no, no. When I speak a word over your life, I will always give you the pieces to produce what I've planted inside you. We live in a generation that wants things instantly. We live in a generation that wants things right now. But in a microwave generation, we serve a crockpot God. We serve a God who likes to slow cook purpose who likes to slow cook character, who likes to slow cook integrity, who likes to slow cook the season that we're in to produce the richest flavors in our life. I don't know about you guys, but TV meals, they don't slap. Well, there's nothing better than a crock pot. And God is looking to see would we be willing to go slowly through the process, the seasons, the situations that we find ourselves in to produce the promise and the purpose that God is creating in our life? And here's Joseph. He's he's in a season of his life that doesn't look anything like what he saw. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Watch this. Things go from bad to worse. The the Bible describes Joseph as uh, being relatively attractive. So in other words, we could just say he's like a 10 out of 10. And he finds favor in Potiphar's home. And Potiphar's wife finds him, let's just say, desirable. She tries to sleep with him. The Bible says that Joseph flees from her. Out of rejection, maybe even a little embarrassment, she then goes to her husband and communicates to Potiphar that his slave tried to sleep with her, totally manipulating and twisting the situation. Now, naturally, hearing that news, the husband, Potiphar, is rather upset, so he finds Joseph and he throws him in a prison. But notice this. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 21, Joseph finds himself moving from a pit to a prison as if life could not get any farther from the promise that God had spoken over his life. But watch this, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the prison. Isn't it interesting that some of the places that we find ourselves in life can feel like prisons? There's no way of escaping it. There's no way of getting out. And I've often discovered that it's in the seasons that feel like prisons that we want to give up the most. Because this is, what you, this is what you see when so many people never reach their purpose. No, no, so many people don't reach their potential because the, this season feels like a dry season a desert season where you don't feel what you used to feel. You don't sense what you used to sense. You don't see God moving the same way anymore. You don't hear God speaking the same way anymore. And because it's not what we expected, we ask God to take us out of it. Because how many of you guys know, we want God's promises, but we don't want to walk through God's process. So we go and we say, God, where are you? This is not at all like I expected this to happen. This is way too hard. This is not what I thought I'd be seeing. I don't sense you like I used to. But notice, up to this point in the text, Joseph never, not one time, asked God to take him out of it. Why is that? Do you notice that in the text, verse 21? The Lord was with Joseph. Students, what if the reason God has not taken you out of it yet, out of the pain, out of the hardship, out of the problem, out of the drama, is because God wants to walk you through it. That ain't sexy. (laughs) But hear me, 
what if God understands that if he takes you out of every difficult and confusing moment of your life, you will never develop and produce the fruit that he wants to produce in your life. He's saying, hey, if I take you out of it, I can't produce this stuff in you. Hear me, God won't ever lead you into seasons that stink just for you to suffer, but he will allow you to enter seasons that stink to allow things to surface. Some of us were wondering, why am I so dysfunctional? Good, God's uprooting things. You've just never been in a position in your life where that area was exposed. Y'all, there is nothing more revealing to your own dysfunction than marriage. Just wait. <laughs> we glamorize this thing and just yet, literally on the way here, babe, weren't we just talking? I'm, I'm messed up. You're messed up. We all messed up. But here's the deal. Marriage is one of the most beautiful things to show you a reflection of you. And God will use situations because he's entrusted us with the situation to reveal to us the character in the areas of dysfunction in our life. So here we are. God's saying, you know what? You need to understand, students, that if God led you to it, he will lead you through it. Come on, if you're in the process, somebody needs to know you're making progress. God's still moving in your life. And I wonder if God's saying, keep going, keep moving, keep praying, keep trusting. Greater is what I'm producing in you than what you see around you. He's saying, hey, I'm producing character in your life. I'm producing fruit in your life. I'm producing confidence in your life. And the thing that you feel like is crippling you is actually creating in you the very thing that's necessary for you to carry the mantle that God has for your life. So many of us reject the struggle, but we don't understand that the struggle always produces the strength. How do you go to a gym, all you that play sports? you crush your muscle down so it can build back up. How is anointing produced in the Bible? Anointing oil, by the crushing, by the crushing. Are we people, are we a generation that would be willing to embrace the process regardless of where we find ourselves and continue to walk towards the promise that God has for us. It may not always make sense. It may feel like things are not coming together, that everything's just in pieces, that this stuff isn't really working. But hear me, God gave you a glimpse to walk towards it, to build it, to put it together in our time. And he's cultivating the character that's needed to sustain the calling and the purpose that God has placed over your life. And Joseph kept going, even when he was in the pit, even when he was in the prison. He kept going when it didn't make sense. He kept going when things didn't add up. So when you're in the process, hear me, the pain never looks like it has a purpose or a point to it. We don't want the struggle to produce the strength, but hear me, the very thing that you're asking God to take you out of is the very thing that God is using that you prayed for years ago to produce in you. God will use the process. God will use it. But you need to understand the point of the process isn't supposed to look like the promise. The point of the process is to produce in you an ability to endure, to keep going when you don't see what you thought you'd see, to trust God when you're not seeing what he said. Hear me, you don't need faith when you always see what you want. You need faith when you don't see what you thought you'd see. That's when faith becomes necessary. And so many of us, we are struggling to trust God, but hear me, not seeing what you thought you'd see is actually the soil that God uses to produce a deeper trust in him because our faith becomes necessary. 
And the second thing I want you to know about the process is God uses the process to prepare you for the promise. Can I get a keys as we kind of slowly land the plane here today? God uses the process to prepare you for the promise. The reality is, students, God has already prepared the way. Now he's just preparing you. Now he's just preparing you. And what's in most important to God is not what you're walking to in life, it's how you're walking to it. Here we are, Joseph's in prison, and all of a sudden, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker get thrown into the prison with Joseph. Now, the Bible says that these two men, they have these dreams that startle them, and Joseph, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he begins to interpret their dreams. He says, hey, uh, you know what, Baker, bad news. You're actually going to die. But the cupbearer, you're going to be released. And in Genesis chapter 40, verse 12, Joseph then begins to say in verse 14, but hey, cupbearer, when you get released, this is the moment I think Joseph kind of slipped and missed it. He says, when you get released, only remember me because I was placed here wrongly and mentioned me to Pharaoh. Throw my name out so he knows I was placed here wrongly. Do you notice this? Joseph in this text is now beginning to try to manipulate the situation. He's trying to manipulate and push forward the process that God has him in. As if you and I could ever increase the perfection of God's timing. And here's what I've learned about myself. What I want isn't always what I need. And the only way for me to know what I need is to not get what I want. Verse 23 says this, the cupper left the prison and the Bible says he forgot about Joseph. How does that happen? This dude just prophesied and predicted your release in prison and then all of a sudden he forgets about the very person that said, hey, this is going to happen in your life. See, I don't believe this was just some slip of the mind. I believe this was divinely orchestrated by God. I believe that God knew Joseph needed more time. Because there's not just a process of walking towards your promised students. There is also a process of waiting for it. This process of waiting. Now, this is our least favorite part in the process. It's when we often don't understand, though, that the waiting process is what God uses to prepare us for the purpose. And just like many of us right now, we see that Joseph is in a season of preparation. We see that he's in a season that feels extremely lonely extremely isolating. Let's be honest, preparation and the waiting season is a really hard time to sit back because we often see everyone else doing what God has called us to do. And we often see what everyone else is doing about what we feel God has called us to be. And it's difficult, but hear me students, preparation is necessary for the purpose that God has for you. Now, before all y'all were even born, there was actually a process to developing an image. Uh, Many of us, we could pull out our cell phones right now and take a photo and instantly be ready. But back in the good old days, there was a process to developing photos. People would take an image and they would submerge it in this thing called a developer's solution. And it would be a chemical that would produce and pull out the image. But first, the image, after it was soaked and submerged, it would need to be placed in a room called the dark room. Now, the dark room is just like it sounds. It was a room with no light. But what's interesting is in this room, with the solution completely submerged, with no light around it, completely isolated, completely alone, completely in the dark, an image would begin to be produced. And if light ever received or touched the image prematurely before it was fully developed, it would corrupt the image. Students, God knows when we are not ready 
to receive the promise that he has for us. God knows that if we are not prepared, we will corrupt the very thing that he's called us to because of the lack of character in our life. God takes his time, students. He takes his time creating, cultivating, developing within us what's needed to sustain the work he has created us to do. And it's in the hidden, dark, lonely, isolating moments that God does his greatest work in us. In a time where we live in this generation where we just value the finished product, we serve a God who values the work in progress. Come on guys, I don't, I'm not perfect, but I'm making progress. I slip up all the time, but the Bible says a righteous man gets up seven times. We're not defined by how we fall. We're defined by how we get up again. And what would there be some students in Elk River, Minnesota that would say, God, regardless of how many times I slip, regardless of how many times I fall, I'm gonna get back up again. I'm gonna keep walking. I'm gonna keep waiting. I'm gonna keep trusting. I'm gonna keep believing. I'm gonna keep hoping that God will see me through. Come on, somebody. If God has taken you to it, God will lead you through it. So here's Joseph. He's like, you know what? This really sucks. I'm not seeing what I thought I'd see, but God knew he wasn't ready yet. God was working on him. God was doing something in him. In some of the hardest situations, in the hardest seasons of my life, I have often God asked God to say, God, would you change my situation? But hear me, students, God is more interested in changing your heart. He's more interested in changing your perspective. And so many of us are tired of the problems we see, but we're not tired of our patterns that produce them. God's saying, you know what? Let me work on your character. Let me work on the drama that keeps creating all this dysfunction in your life. Let me work on this thing that's hidden inside of you that keeps driving a lot of the dysfunction in your life. Here's the deal. God, I wanna say it like this. The will of God, I think, and I can back this up scripturally, has less to do with what you and I do, has less to do with our career, where we place our identity, but it has to do with who we're created to be. Like the will of God is not just about what you do, because hear me, what you do constantly changes. And so many people place their identity in the activity of what God has called them to do for a season. But he's saying, hey, no, my will is for you to become a better woman of God. My will is for you to become a wiser woman of God. My will for your life is to be mature, to bear fruit, to develop the fruit of the spirit in your life, to be full of joy, to be full of faith, to be full of self-control, patience, kindness, and gentleness. That is my will for your life. It's not about being an evangelist. It's not about being a business owner. It's not about being the biggest and the baddest youth pastor. It is about being a follower of Jesus that allows the Holy Spirit to change and transform your life. That's the will of God. Don't confuse what you're called to. Here, let me define this. Your purpose is who you are created to be. Your calling is what you are created to do and your calling will change. Your calling is the assignment that God has right in front of you. It's the season of life. As an evangelist, this is my calling right now, but believe me, this is not my purpose. My purpose is to know God and for God to know me. My purpose is to have God work out of me the things he didn't put in me, to produce in the things in me that he wants to produce in me. That's my purpose. And that only can come in the environments that are totally opposite to what I want to produce. Hear me, students. Your gift will make room for you before kings, the Bible says. Your gift may get you there, 
but your character keeps you there. Here's the deal. The development and growth of character in our life is up to us because our character is created. The Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. If you can corrupt character, by that logic, you can create character. Now, I don't know about you, but your character is developed and created by the choices you make consistently. Because hear me, who you are today is a result of the decisions you've made over the last couple years. You don't like the life you're living, check the choices you're choosing. He's saying, you know what? Your development is up to me, is up to, up to us. Are we willing to submit? So here's the deal, I'm almost done. The Bible says in Psalms 105, you ever read the Bible and you're like, I never noticed this verse before. It says this, until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. He tested his character because someone who's never been tested cannot be trusted with God's promise. He says this, God will not take you into the promise if you are not willing to wait through the process. You wanna know how long it was from the moment that Joseph was in the pit to the moment that he was still in the prison? 13 years, 13 years, 13 years of development, 13 years of waiting, 13 years of preparation, and it's in the waiting that God's producing character. It's in the waiting that you are becoming who God has created you to be. And could it be that who you are becoming is more important than when you're arriving? Woo! It's more important than what you're doing. Ah! That kills us. Because we want our significance to come from what we do. But here's the thing. God uses this season of waiting to work out of us the things he didn't put in us. To work in the faith to work in the integrity, to work in the consistency, to work in the ability to grit down and have the faith to walk through. The last point, final point as I land this plane is God has a purpose for the process. So here's Joseph. He then hears that Pharaoh has this dream that's startling him and the cupbearer in this divine moment of recall remembers Joseph and he's like, hey bro, I remember this dude totally interpreted a dream of mine. I need you to come. I'm gonna need you to grab him. I need you to bring him. And Joseph now stands before Pharaoh and Joseph gives an interpretation and says, hey, there's gonna be seven years of famine and there's gonna be seven years of harvest. You need to prepare. So they prepare, they plan. And Pharaoh is so moved by the wisdom of Joseph and the, the divine gifting that God has given him, that Pharaoh places him in charge of literally the preparation for this famine and this harvest that's coming. Now, harvest hits seven years, then famine hits seven years. And Joseph's brothers, remember his family at the beginning? They are out of food and they're like, bro, we need some food, but we know that there's a stockpile in Egypt, so we're gonna go to Egypt. Here the brothers of Joseph are, the very people that threw him into a pit, that sold him into slavery. They now end up standing before Joseph, unaware that this is Joseph. Because here's the deal. From the moment that they threw him into slavery to the moment that they stood before him was 22 years, 22 years. 22 years, students, of walking faithfully with Jesus. 22 years of tripping up, of trying to manipulate things. 22 years of waiting. 22 years of God producing in his life things, deficits, producing character. And he looks at his brothers, he finally reveals, he says, hey, I know what you did was horrible. I know what you did was terrible, but I need you to know God took what the enemy meant for evil and used it for good. And students, I need you to hear me that whatever you walk through, on whatever you walk through in your life, you may have a promise from God. You got this image, you got this vision, you got this dream, this purpose, but hear me. Even when life feels like it's in pieces, 
Even when nothing is coming together, I need you to know God works the tears. God works the frustration. God works the pain. He works the agony. He works the doubt. He works the rage. He works the betrayal. He works the offense. He works the good, the bad, and the ugly all together for his good and for your good. Students, don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Keep trusting. Keep hoping. Keep believing. Better are the days ahead of you than the days behind you. It may not look like you thought it looked. It may not seem like you thought it would seem like, but hear me, God had a plan. God had a purpose. And hear me, I guarantee you, Joseph knew the character of God more because of the crushing and the frustration and the areas of isolation in his life. But while he was learning to walk towards the promise, even though it took longer because he had to wait, he understood that God was working in him. Y'all, I don't wanna spend my entire life walking and waiting and not letting God work. Hear me, God's delay doesn't mean his denial. So we all need to trust that if God is saying, hey, not yet, trust that it's not for right now. God's doing something. And right now, I know I'm over time, but I just want to pray for every single student in this room. I don't really have this grand altar response, but honestly, I just want to pray for faith to rise up in you guys. For you to get a a, a word from God, a vision from God, and for you to hold on to anchor that down. Because there will be times of trial. There will be times of difficulty, but students, hear me. Greater is he that lives in you than he that's in the world. There's going to be all types of hell and problems and havoc that are going to try to make your way. But hear me, God has a plan for every horrible nightmare moment, issue, problem, trauma that is in your life. Every student head bow, eye closed. God, I pray right now that you would fill us with faith to endure. I pray you'd fill us with faith to keep walking to keep trusting, to keep believing, to keep praying. God, I pray that we would see a move of God in these students, that even if we fall, God, we're not marked by how we fall. We're marked by how we get up again. God, I pray this would be a generation of students that would keep going. And Lord, even in the waiting, even in the dark room, the areas where we're being developed, the areas where we're being stretched, the areas where we're being cultivated. God, I pray that this would be a room full of women and men that have integrity, that can carry the call, that can carry the purpose that you have placed inside them. And God, I thank you that even in all the mess of life, you can redeem, you can restore, and you, you've entrusted us to walk through it for your purpose, for our good. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, if you receive that, can you say amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Worship team's gonna end with our song today. Let's lift our hands and say, God, we submit to you. God, we surrender to you. God, would you have your way in our life? In Jesus' name, everybody said amen.